have our fourth. Today we're going to have our fourth and final webinar in our New York Cannabis series. So we started with infrastructure, then we talked about lights. Last week we heard a lot about nutrition. And this week we're going to hear from Erica Hernandez again. Today, Erica is going to focus on pest control. She's going to talk us through which pests we're likely to encounter, how we can scout for these. She's going to spend time on which BCAs are effective, and then she'll touch on some chemistry at the very end. So it's another great um, information-packed session. I think you're all going to enjoy it. Erica, thanks for, so much for being here and doing this with us today. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction, Tammy. Um, so I'm just going to dive right into it. Again, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box, or um, we can just ask them at the end of the webinar. We will have a Q&A time um, at that time. So let's get started. What are we gonna cover today? Tammy gave us a little bit of an introduction on there. We're talking about PEST and BCA ID, and I'll go over what that is. We're gonna review some scouting techniques that you can take today and go use them in your grows today. And we'll discuss some specific chemicals for New York State and how to find more information on them. But let's start off with some background. What is IPM? This is gonna be really important when we're discussing any sort of pest management program. IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management, and this is a process that's based on an ecosystem-wide strategy, multiple strategies to help you deal with pest issues, be it, be it a disease, be it insects, be it mites, anything. If we look here on the right-hand side, we see a little bit of a visualization of how these strategies all fit together. So Integrated Pest Management, or IPM, is going to assign different priorities to different types of strategies so that we can really minimize the risk to human health, beneficial organisms, and the environment as we step through each of the tools of our pest control or pest management system. With any IPM program, we always want to start with prevention. Prevention is key. It's better to start stop anything from getting into our facility than trying to deal with something that is already there. I, I think we can all probably agree with that one. But if prevention fails, and we always have to assume that at some point we are going to miss something, we move on to our next strategies, um, which are going to be the next least harmful or least risky to human health and everything else. Looking at cultural or sanitation practices, so making changes to our environment, uh, lowering moisture or um, you know cleaning hard surfaces, things like that to cut down on inoculum for disease or places for our pests to hide. Uh, next up after our cultural sanitation, we come to our physical or mechanical strategies, things like uh, you know removing weeds, removing old dead plant material, or changing the way we lay out our structure in a way that helps us control flow of activity or introduction of new pests into our facilities. And then finally, if all of those um, are not enough to help us manage, we can move on to our biological controls, which can take two forms. And we'll talk a lot about our biological controls today. We're going to talk about our beneficial insects, which would be one form of biological control. And we are also going to talk a little bit about biopesticides, which is another form of biological control, which most biopesticides do qualify as an EPA registered chemical, but um, you know they're on the softer chemistry side and they're least risky or less risky to human health and our beneficial organisms. And then finally, if all else fails, we do have lots of options of harsher chemistry because you know ultimately we are trying to have a successful crop, but we wanna make sure we are pursuing the least amount of risk um, to deal with each of these problems as they go along. So in summary, IPM is how do we prioritize our pest management and what are those tools? So now that we've gotten that, 
background, let's talk about what pests we're actually trying to manage in these programs. I mean, the first step to prevention is knowing what you're trying to prevent. So when it comes to cannabis, there's quite a number of pests that would prey on cannabis just like any other crop, but there are some um, recurring figures that we wanna keep our eyes open for. Number one that we will see in a lot of grows is the two spotted spider mite. And you can see a picture of one of them right here with their very characteristic two spots, two large spots um, in their adult bodies. Now there's various species of spider mite out there. The two spotted spider mite is the most common, but you may see others. Um, typically when we're looking at the two spotted spider mite, <coughs> excuse me, these are going to be in this appearance for the most part. And they're a little difficult to see. Um, if you look on this other right hand side, um, you'll see this picture of um, just a side branch coming out of a cannabis stem. And you can see that we've got some webbing and some dots here. These are actually what the spider mites are going to look to look like basically with your naked eye. So you can see them, but it could be difficult to identify them. They are under one millimeter in size typically. And the signs that we're going to be looking for, you can see one of them here is the webbing. Uh, spider mites, two spotted spider mites in particular, will generate this webbing when infestations get um, pretty severe. So if you're seeing something like this, you've got a big problem. Uh, but one of the first signs that we see is leaf stippling. And I'm gonna show you some examples of that shortly. Where we typically find them are going to be on the underside of leaves or on stem elbows, as we've seen here. And it's always good to, keep, uh, to understand the life cycle of your pests. So I've included some life cycle information for each of the pests we'll talk about today. Um, you're mostly going to see the adults of the two-spotted spider mite. You could find some eggs, um, but they can be difficult to spot. So if you're seeing adults, just assume that the rest of these life cycle are present somewhere. Next up, thrips. So these are also super duper common. Um, in particular, we see Western flower thrips, um, AKA Franklin Yelia, <laughs> goodness, Occidentalis. Um, those Latin names always trip me up. But if you say Western flower thrips, we know what you're talking about. Some other species that we may see could be onion thrips or chili thrips. Western flower thrips are just the most common. Um, and they tend to look you know, like this on the right-hand side. These guys are a little bit easier to spot with the naked eye. Um, they're a tiny bit larger than the spider mites, but not by much. So these are still going to take a keen eye to find them on your plants. Uh, the Western flower thrip is going to be almost entirely foliar based, foliage based, but they do have a media based life stage. And again, this comes back to understanding our life cycle of our pest. With the thrips, um, you'll see that they are egg layers and these eggs tend to be laid in the foliage. But once we've got, once we have these uh, larvae popping out, we see that the uh, pre-pupa and the pupa actually drop down to the soil or the growing media. So if you're in uh, rock wool, cocoa, peat, you will see this life stage in the media and all of these guys are going to be in your foliage. Signs of this, again, uh, leaf stippling. And don't worry, that example is coming up right away. Uh, Western flower thrips will feed on pollen, but they also will have piercing sucking and sort of rasping mouth parts. So they will be piercing into your plants and sort of rasping away or sucking away at some of the plant juices in the foliage. That's what they are feeding on. You'll find them on the upper and the lower leaf surfaces, and they tend to hide in the nooks and crannies of plants. So let's talk about stippling really quick. When I say stippling, stippling tends to mean a sort of general a dotted or dusky, dusty appearance. And I have two different examples to show for you here on a cannabis plant. 
So these two leaves have two different types of stippling. You'll see in the middle, we've got sort of a general all over dotted appearance here. And you can see that, you know, this is a, some of the chlorophyll has been broken down. Uh, possibly some of the plant juices have been sucked out and fed upon. And this is generally when it's at this stage, it's not harming the plant, but it is an indication that there is pest activity. And on the right hand side here, we see sort of a different type of stippling, more of these sort of polka dotted um, dot appearances, but they're much more clustered together in these small groups rather than all over. You can see the rest of the leaf is mostly untouched. In the middle, with this all over stippling appearance, this is what we expect to see with two spotted spider mite feeding. So they have, they, they kind of roam all over and they feed from all over the plant um, indiscriminately. With this right hand side, with these clustered pieces of stippling, this is more what we would see out of thrips feeding. They will feed in these little clusters and you'll even see little black specks of insect grass or poop um, as they are feeding. So when you're looking at these different types of stippling, this is a very easy way to tell the difference between spider mite in the middle or thrips stippling. Um, and these are, uh, you'll often see this before you see the pest, unfortunately. So this is stippling, keep your eyes open for it in your crop. Next up, we've got aphids. Everybody knows and everybody hates aphids. And we also know that there are many, many different types of aphids out there. Fortunately for us, uh, most of the types of treatments that we have will affect almost all aphids equally. But uh, foliar aphids are from various families in the order Hemiptera. We've got aphididae. <laughs> Canada aphididae, and many more. So there's, there's a lot out there. And honestly, in most scenarios, I would not waste your time trying to identify specific species of aphid unless you're having a really hard time dealing with it, but that's gonna be a very niche scenario. What you have to remember about aphids is no matter what species they are, aphids will multiply rapidly. A single aphid female can give birth to as many as 12 offspring per day, more in some cases, less in others, and oftentimes dependent on temperature. For aphids, the, the signs that you're gonna be looking for are primarily cast skins and honeydew. So what does that mean? Um, aphids go through uh, several life stages where they don't really change form. Uh, they're, become larger and they have to shed their exoskeleton at every stage to move on to that next stage. And that results in a lot of shed skin. And you end up seeing a lot of that on your plants as you are seeing colonies grow. And for honeydew, what we see is that with aphids, they also have piercing sucking mouth parts. They're sucking out the plant juices. And as they do that, they excrete sugars and just deposit them on the plants. So they are basically pooping out sugar onto your leaves, which leaves sort of a, a shiny layer of sugary residue on your plants. And this can be de um, a detrimental because it can encourage mold growth, things like that. When you are looking for aphids, you're going to typically scout on the underside of leaves. You're also going to be looking at the tender new growth. That's where aphids like to feed the most and you know any new stems that are forming, whether um, it's the new stems, whether you're looking at um, tiny new baby leaves, anything that's tender and just developing is really going to draw in those aphids. And something to remember as well, this picture captures it very well, is that aphids do have a winged form. You can see here, this is a winged aphid. And this is a non-winged aphid. This is an aphid nymph, something that's probably just been born recently, and a cast skin. These are all the same organism, just at different life stages. You'll start to see winged aphids when you see uh, colonies getting really dense. 
but they are all the same. They're, you're not looking at different species of pests. It's all one organism. The winged aphids can really throw some people off. So it's good to acknowledge that early on. Next up, root aphids. If there's any insect that's been demonized more, I don't, I don't know that I've heard about it. Uh, root aphids are a scourge for cannabis growers for a number of reasons. And typically when we're talking about root aphids, we're talking about the rice root aphid. And this has all the same life stages that I just discussed. Um, however, uh, though they do have a foliar stage, you're primarily going to find them in the root zone. And this can be tricky because it's a lot more difficult to scout a root zone, especially if you're growing in something like a cloth container or um, you know, a plastic bag. It can be difficult to look in there and see if you're finding any, any root aphids crawling around on your roots. So signs you wanna look for Oftentimes the first signs that you'll see root aphid infestation is that you may start to see something that looks like a nutritional deficiency. Um, your plants might just be looking a little underfed even though you haven't changed anything in your fertilizer program. And when you see that, it's always a good idea to look at your root zone. It could be root aphids, it could be something going on with your roots other, otherwise. Um, but nutritional deficiency symptoms are often one of the first things we want to look at. With um, the other things that we're dealing with, the cast skin on the leaves or roots, you will st still see those. And winged adults can still form. The difference here is that when we have a winged adult flying from our root zone to another plant, which is how these guys end up spreading, they will form only small colonies on the new plant. And then those aphids travel downward to the root zone. So you don't see the foliar colonies with root zone or with uh, root aphids that you would with other aphids. But you will see flying adults on sticky cards. You might see after an irrigation event that some aphids have been flushed out of your containers, uh, but primarily you'll be finding them if you're digging through your root zone in the media. So this is, this is a difficult one um, and takes a lot of attention to, um, to find it and then to deal with it. And we'll talk about some of that soon. Next up, fungus gnats. Fungus gnats aren't um, a super big issue in terms of plant health because fungus gnats really don't feed too much on the plant itself. Uh, larva in, in their larval stage, they can chew up young plant roots and they can carry fungi, but once you've gotten past the young plant stage, these guys don't really tend to um, promote too much harm in the crop. They're more of a nuisance and they can become a significant nuisance as their uh, populations can get out of control very quickly. What you'll see with these is you'll often find them clouding up your sticky cards um, and you'll see that as I said, they can chew up young plant roots, so you might be seeing poor seedling or clone health. And what you'll also see is that having a lot of fungus gnats in your facility is kind of an indicator that you're growing things a little wet. So you might want to draw back the moisture in your facility, or you might want to um, pursue another uh, different options that we'll discuss uh, for control or maintenance. They're primarily found in the media in the top 1.5 to two inches as larva. So very surface level, um, so soil surface. And as adults, they will sort of fly up and around to the lower plant leaves, but they tend to stick close to the surface of the media in general. Or you'll find them on your yellow sticky cards as you can see here. Eggs are laid in the media, larva hang out in the media. Uh, they pupate and then they turn into adults there. All right, and shore flies are another winged, uh, winged pest that we have to deal with. And again, it's another sort of nuisance issue. Um, what we tend to see is that, again, um, if you have a lot of algae in particular, you'll start to see more shore flies show up. But what we wanna acknowledge here with shore flies is that we do wanna be able to tell the difference between a shore fly and a fungus gnat. 
And there's some pretty key characteristics. You can see here a shorefly almost just looks like a, a tiny miniature housefly. Whereas the fungus gnats, they've got these long thin legs. Sometimes they have fuzzy antennas. Sometimes they have uh, thin antennas, depending on if you're dealing with a, a certain species of midge versus the traditional fungus gnat. Uh, but the shoreflies are, you know, have a very significantly different appearance, but it can be difficult to tell if you don't spot them sitting still somewhere. Um, one key characteristic as well is that if you look at shorefly wings, they have um, a pattern of five lighter spots on the wings as well. So wing appearance is very characteristic. Um, and again, if you're seeing a lot of shore flies, this is an indicator that maybe you're growing too wet. Uh, maybe you've got some algae uh, growing in some areas that you may not observe, or maybe you've got algae growing in your irrigation system. Definitely something that you will want to be aware of and take care of with some sanitation and cultural control practices. All right, we've got two more. The russet mite is definitely something that strikes fear into the heart of a lot of growers and can be really difficult to deal with. Uh, but, you know, dealing with it, the first step to dealing with it is identification. So let's talk about what that looks like. Um, I've got a picture here uh, at about 40 X. So these are very, very tiny. You will not be able to see these with the naked eye you have to use a hand lens or a microscope to scout, to scout these guys. And they have a very distinctive shape. So if you see these under the microscope, there's really no mistaking them for anything else. They're much smaller than thrips, even though they might seem to be about the same shape, they're very much different in size. And with um, the signs that you're looking for, we're gonna be looking for general nutritional deficiency symptoms, such as yellowing, might be another indicator that uh, you've got the russet mites in there. But uh, significantly, you'll see that with russet mites, new growth being cupped upward is a key characteristic that we're looking for when we're looking for uh, russet mite infestation. And if you see something like this, this is an indicator that it's, it's pretty bad. The general nutritional deficiency symptoms is going to be earlier on in your infestation. And if you're seeing anything like that, you really want to investigate what is causing that. We're looking for russet mites. They're going to typically be found on the undersides of leaves and the newer growth. So you can see here, we have the newer growth is the most affected. Contrasting that with the broad mite, another, um, Another issue that we run into quite frequently. Broad mites are going to have um, a couple different things that you're gonna look for, uh, especially with the broad mites, the eggs are very characteristic to identify them. So if you're looking under the microscope, again, this is not something that is visible with the naked eye. You have to use at least a hand lens or a microscope. If you are able to find an egg, they have this characteristic deflated golf ball appearance where this right here is an egg. You can see this sort of oblong. It's got that kind of pattern on it. That is a broad mite egg. And what these guys do, they actually inject toxin into plant material during feeding. So you end up with twisted new growth and just really poor plant appearance overall. So with the broad mites, those are also found around growing points and on newer leaves, but they're highly upwardly mobile. So a new infestation might start with um, plants appearing twisted uh, down below in the canopy and that moving upward throughout, the, throughout that plant. You'll see here a couple of different pictures of the broad mites in action and their life cycle. All right, so we talked a lot about, about pests. So what can we do about these? Our first option that we're gonna to turn to is gonna be BCAs or biological control agents. So what are the big ones that we use in cannabis? So let's first talk about our thrips predators with our cucumeris and our swirsky. So cucumeris and swirsky are predatory mites. Um, cucumeris is probably one of the most widely used predatory mites here. You can see they have a very similar appearance. Um, 
Cucumeris feed not only on thrips, but they also feed on broad mites and cyclamen mites. So utilizing these guys is a great option for preventative control of multiple pest species. And um, you'll see that they have, between the two of these species, there are a couple of differences that might make you choose one or the other. Cucumeris tend to uh, prefer lower temperatures and higher humidity, whereas Sorsky, which also feed on larval thrips, they tend to work better in higher temperatures. So if you are having an issue with thrips and you've got a hotter greenhouse, Swirsky might be the um, pest, uh, the BCA for you. Whereas if you are dealing with maybe a cooler greenhouse and maybe you're afraid of broad mites getting in there and you also have thrips, you might wanna go with cucumeris. So choosing your species here based on your environmental conditions is one of the main factors for that choice. Next up, another Thrips uh, predator all-star. We've got Atheta coriaria, AKA Delosha coriaria, AKA the Rove beetle. This guy's been through a lot of name changes. This uh, BCA goes after Thrips, shoreflies, springtails, and fungus gnat larva. So this one does it all, hangs out in the media, and is highly mobile by both crawling and flying. Uh, but you're gonna find them most often in those top layers of your media looking for your, um, your fungus gnat larva, your springtails, etc. You'll also find them hanging out underneath pots. You'll find them um, between the pot and the media on the side of your containers. Uh, they, they really go all out. They're very mobile, they get everywhere. They consume 10 to 20 prey per day. So they are fairly effective and they're, they're pretty active, um, but you wanna remember that these guys are nocturnal. So they tend to um, do all that hunting at night. If you're producing in a 24 hour uh, photo period for clones or something like that, probably not, a, not the best choice for this BCA. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're fairly long lived. They live for 21 days and they are really tenacious. They, um, they do really well in a lot of different environments and temperature conditions in terms of um, survival and hunting. Just rem remembering that they're nocturnal is a key portion there. Next up, we've got something to start treating our aphids and that's going to be our aphidious wasps, primarily Aphidius colmani and Aphidius irvi. So you may have heard of these before. And um, the reason why we want to have multiple species of aphids is remember, I talked about how many different species of aphids there are out there. One of the differentiators between the two of them is, or between them is size. So Aphidius colmani is going to go after smaller species of aphids, such as the green peach aphid, whereas Irvi will go after larger species of aphids, such as potato aphids. So if um, what you'll see with these products is that they're often offered in combination, you'll get a mix of Aphidius colmani and Aphidius Irvi. And um, with this, you've got coverage over multiple species of aphid and you don't have to do as much work trying to identify with which aphid has moved in there. With the aphidious wasps, they arrive as mummies ready to emerge. So you'll see, you'll get a vial that's kind of full of something that looks like a bunch of aphids. And you'd be correct because the way these work, the wasps will actually lay their eggs inside of the aphid and that egg will hatch into a larva and cause the aphid to die and swell until finally the aphidious wasp bursts out like something out of alien and goes off to hunt for more aphids to parasitize. Time from an egg to adult wasp emergence is two to two and a half weeks at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Typically you don't have to worry about this because when you are ordering from an insectary, you are ordering aphidious wasps and mummies that will be ready to um, emerge within one to four days after <coughs> receipt. For preventative releases, we typically recommend every other week because these guys are going to 
hunt down any aphids that are coming into your facility before you'll have a chance to find them. Um, and that every other week release is a great um, interval for these guys to be effective. Oops, sorry. Next up, we've got some spider mite preventative uh, predators, Andersoni and Californicus. And here's a couple of pictures again. You'll notice that these are pretty similar to what we saw with the Cucumeris and the Swirsky. And that's because these are all from the same family of predatory mites. So there's going to be a lot of overlap in their appearance. And there's also some overlap in what they're going to feed on. So Andersoni, while we recommend it as a spider mite um, predator preventative. It also hunts russet mite, broad mite, cyclamen mites, and Lewis mites. And um, this actually will uh, tolerate a large range of humidity and conditions, but does prefer, um, will actually be active up to over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So our Andersoni is a, a really um, solid predator for a lot of different conditions. Now with the Californicus, again, this is our uh, another spider mite preventative, but we'll also hunt some immature thrips along with the broad mites and the cyclamen, cyclamen mites. European red mites as well, but that's not really something that we have to deal with much. Um, but with the Californicus, that tends to prefer a lower humidity environment and a slightly lower temperatures, slightly smaller range. So being aware of what your um, environmental conditions, again, comes into play here when choosing your, um, your predators to incorporate in your greenhouse. Uh, next, we've got the lacewing larva, um, Chrysoperla rufilibris. You may also see Chrysoperla carnea. These are generalist predators and um, they are so generalist that they are also cannibals. They will eat each other if you are not careful. Um, this is what they look like. I, I've heard them described as uh, little crocodiles. I, I think that's kind of a cute way to talk about them. And I, you know, I like watching them at work. Uh, what they do is they will literally catch anything they can get their little chompers on and they will inject digestive juices into their prey and liquefy those body contents and suck it all out. When it comes to aphids, aphids are probably one of their um, primary prey species. They can consume up to 50 aphids per day and larvae are going to have two to three weeks of feeding before they will pupate and turn into the adults. Unfortunately, the adults tend to leave the greenhouse. They do have wings and they just fly away. Um, if you're lucky, you might, oops, sorry. If you're lucky, you might see them lay some eggs before they leave, but it's definitely not something that we rely upon. And we treat these as a good curative, but not as a preventative uh, because they do feed a lot. So if you're putting them out there, and there's no prey for them, they are just going to die. They're going to starve fairly quickly or they will just crawl away. Finally, while we don't recommend ladybug, I'll tell you why, it's definitely worth including for a number of reasons. There's uh, quite a number of ladybug uh, species out there. The main ones we see are Hippodamia convergens or Adelia bipunctata. Um, these are gonna feed on both larva aphids as larva and adults. Um, however, uh, they are difficult to maintain a consistent population because again, they're highly mobile, they'll fly away and they have a strong homing instinct. So if you're not on the West Coast, they really wanna leave and go back to the West Coast for <laughs> the most part, they will just fly away. Um, these are pretty, and I would say these do the best PR for beneficial insects out there, but they are not the most effective. They will not feed to extermination. They will just kind of feed as they can and then fly away. So uh, important to talk about why people like them, because they're pretty, they're identifiable, and we do know that they, they feed, but it's very difficult to um, use this as a control. All right, so some scouting techniques. Let's get into that. 
Um, there's a couple of scouting techniques that uh, I want to talk about that you can take this information back and use it right away as you go back into your facility. So first off, sticky cards. What are they? I, I'm sure you guys have seen a sticky card before, but proper use of sticky cards can be, um, you know, you, you got to be, you got to know what you're doing with them. What we're using these sticky cards for, we are typically going to be monitoring winged insects only. So thrips, white fly, aphid, fungus gnat, shore fly. And then remember, if you are putting out any winged beneficial insects, these sticky cards will catch them. Now, we don't use sticky cards as a control strategy. We use this only to monitor. And we're not going to be putting a sticky card, you know, for in, in every pot. We're not going to be putting them every 10 feet. We typically recommend uh, one sticky card per 250 to 500 square feet and changing them weekly or every other week. This is really going to depend on what's going on in your grow rooms because we are using this to collect data. We want to know what's coming into our grow rooms, what's flying around our grow rooms. If we leave these for months at a time and we just keep accumulating insects on them, we're losing a lot of data. So how do we place these? Uh, with sticky cards, we're gonna have a couple of different places that we wanna put them. Typically, um, we wanna put them at the top of our canopy where about the the bottom one third is below the top of the canopy level and the top two thirds is above it. So you'll be mounting this maybe on some supports, maybe on a stick. And at that position, you're going to catch those thrips, the white flies, the aphids. Um, you might catch some beneficials. Then if you're looking to monitor your fungus gnats or shore flies, you're gonna put those closer to your media or any areas you think uh, shore flies and fungus gnats might be hiding out. You also wanna make sure you're push, putting them um, possibly near any entrances or exits, any windows or vents um, to monitor what's, what's coming in, what's going out, what's going on. Um, these are simply data gathering. And you'll see there's a couple of different colors. Yellow is the most common. Blues are uh, traditionally used to attract, uh, attract thrips specifically, but either one, um, is a good tool to use in your facility. <clears throat> Next up, we've got the beat test. So uh, sometimes it can be really difficult to find and identify bugs that are crawling around on your plants. So we got to knock them out of there. We got to figure out how to better take a look at them. With this, this is a really simple one. It requires a piece of white paper, clipboard, the plant that you're trying to test, and uh, a hand lens if you're comfortable with that. And you're gonna hold the clipboard under the plant, under the plant um, to basically just catch anything that might fall off the foliage. And you're just gonna start gently tapping or beating the plant a little bit to dislodge crawling organisms and debris. And once you've got that debris on your clipboard, you're, it's gonna be a lot easier to see, is that debris moving? Did I catch any bugs? And if you do see movement, you can take a look under your hand lens and have a much easier time identifying what might have been crawling around on your plants. We typically recommend that um, you randomly sample, you know, a couple of plants this way and sampling um, different parts of the plants because you might be seeing different pests hanging out, hanging out at different parts of the plants, looking from the top, the middle and the bottom, and not doing every plant this way, again, um, just a random sampling of a couple, depending on how many plants you have in your facility or in that zone. I've talked a lot today about hand lenses and microscopes and magnification. So let's just dig a little deeper into that. Like I said, some pests and BCAs cannot be viewed with the naked eye. Broad mites and russet mites specifically are the ones that we will not be able to see. Uh, for BCAs, nematodes are not viewable with the naked eye either. Some pests are going to be difficult to tell apart without magnification. And uh, I would put winged aphids and fungus gnats, as well as shore flies sometimes, in that category. Um, you'll have a lot easier time if you're using 
a hand lens at the very least. And be aware of the magnification power that you're using. So for hand lenses, you're typically going to see 10X. You might see a 20X or 40X. And what I mean by X is like that's a 10 times your standard magnification or 20 times just your eyes um, ability to see. With stereoscopes, something like this, which would also be called a dissecting scope, you can see a 40 times to 100 times, uh, depending on the model. Um, and then Dynalites or other digital scopes, so something like this you might see that you can plug into your computer. You could go down to 20x, you could go all the way up to 250x, things like that. For each of these, um, I would say, Russet mites and broad mites, you would need to have at least a 20X, um, ideally a 40X. If you're looking for nematodes, I would want you to have at least a 40X, but 100X is great. And with winged aphids and fungus gnats and looking at other winged insects, we want you to have at least that 10X. Areas and materials to check when you're scouting, it's always good to make a list of places that you want to check for um, where you're likely to find these pests. So plant foliage, of course, those are the things we're trying to protect. So we want to select plants at random throughout the crop. Uh, we want to check all incoming plant material for any uh, potential stowaways. So clones or teens that you're getting in. Not much we can do about, um, about seeds and there's typically not too many seed issues. Uh, we also want to check um, our older plant material for moms, uh, for example, if it's hiding any, if they're hiding any um, diseases, if they are hiding any colonies of pests. Oftentimes, if your moms have something wrong with them, your clones are going to share those issues. Also, looking at plants near air exchanges and ingress versus egress, or um, entrances and exits. These are the areas that are most vulnerable to pests getting in and hanging out. And then again, your weekly sticky card checks, just checking to see if something new has happened and has been caught by your monitoring devices. One of the strongest things you can do for an IPM program is develop a good record keeping strategy. And there's, uh, we've talked a, a bit about what you might want to keep in that. But typically, you know, we're talking about weekly scouting and sticky card counts. Um, we want to utilize those sticky cards. And when the best way to utilize that is counting um, pests on our cards. For sticky cards, we want to record things like the number of pests in a one by one inch square on that card. We want to record our dates. We want to record the location um, of our sticky card in relation to um, air movements or uh, ingress, egress, things like that. Uh, when we're keeping uh, scouting records, we start to see you know, trends that will enable us to make better decisions. So week to week changes, seasonal changes and spray response changes are types of trends that we can get from these record keeping activities for scouting. In particular, uh, scouting records can help us determine spray efficacy. Now, there's a lot of people out there that will do a bunch of spraying and just hope for the best, right? Spray and pray. But what is that really doing for us? We really want to use these monitoring strategies to tell us, did the spray work or do we need to change to something else? So in a good um, spray record, we don't just maintain the names and the dates of sprays, although that is the bare minimum. We also want to keep track of the rates that we used, and we also want to tie that to our pest activity on our sticky cards in weeks prior and weeks after spray. So I have an example to share with you. Um, so this comes from Pleasant View Gardens, and they advise to keep the information of recording your card counts and uh, scouting results, use per card per day formula, keeping all numbers comparable, and using those records to look for the trends. So what does looking for those trends look like? This um, information can be graphed out where we can tie, you see all these bars are our pest activity charted over time 
tied to dates across the bottom. And then we've got the dates with our sprays over the top. And you can see here, they made a change and their pest pressure went way up. They never stopped spraying. They just changed what it was they were spraying. And in response to this increase in pressure that they observed on their sticky cards, they were able to change back um, and start to bring that pressure down again. So this is very important information to know to see if your IPM program is working properly. Uh, another thing you can do that is very helpful is learning how to use a hand lens with your phone camera. I think this has been a bit more uh, popular recently. You can use a regular hand lens like this, or you can get a clip-on hand lens, which I've seen more and more of these out, out in the field, and I've actually gotten quite a number of them from um, trade shows, so they are available. Uh, when you're using a regular hand lens, you know, it's just like taking a regular picture, open up your phone camera app, holding your hand lens as close as possible to the phone camera, and you're going to have to do a little bit of moving the phone and the lens close to the subject until it's in focus. But another thing you can do is take a video if snapping pictures is a problem. And the reason why you want to do this is you're able to get more eyes on an issue on either a pest or a disease if you can take a picture and you can record it. You know, like they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. And how I describe one pest might be completely different from how someone else describes it, but you can't argue with what a picture is telling you. And, you know, on the backs of that, taking good pictures, there's a couple of really simple guidelines for this to remember. So remember to first determine your subject. Are you taking a picture of an insect? Uh, is it damage on the leaf? Make sure you know what it is ensure that that subject is in focus. And then you wanna take three pictures. You wanna take a picture of a single leaf showing damage up close, or you know, a picture of the, uh, the perpetrator, the insect or mite, if you're able to find them. Uh, show a single plant uh, showing the location of the damage. Is it at the top, the middle, the bottom, things like that. And then a canopy shot showing a pattern over multiple plants, if applicable. Additional picture, you know, like I said, the insect suspect, <laughs> if you can capture them. All right, finally, let's dive into some pesticides and label topics. When we're talking pesticides, like I said, you know, there's a couple of places where pesticides might fit into our um, IPM programs, and that's going to be as our last resort. But that doesn't mean that these are going to be infrequently used tools. Uh, pesticides of all types are very important, especially uh, you know, with a crop like cannabis where it's a high value crop. We wanna make sure that we use all the tools available to us and that we're using them correctly. So first, let's just look really quick, um, a very high level at some key pieces of info that you can find on uh, pesticide labels that you, you know, bare minimum, you should be able to find these. And one thing that's a little difficult with pesticide labels is oftentimes, you know, these, in, this information will be on every single label, but every single label is a little different. So you might have to do a little bit of hunting. First off, you're going to want to find the brand name, which should be front and center for every pesticide label. Uh, and you're also going to want to find the active ingredients. So for Azagard here, that would be our brand name, we'll see an active ingredient statement, which would be Azadractin in this case. For the manufacturer, um, that might not be on the front page, but it will be somewhere. And I'll show you that in just a second. But um, the next thing that we definitely want to be aware of is our PPE or personal pr protective equipment that is required that will 100% definitely be on every single pesticide label. And you can see a statement of that here. Uh, there will also be information on storage, uh, storage requirements, also on um, you know, just general directions for use uh, and some safety, <coughs> some safety statements. So really quick, we also have, um, this would be considered a, um, 
a container label where we only see the initial statement. We've got, again, our brand name. We've also got our active ingredient. And in this case, we do have the manufacturer. We've got Maroon Bio here. Uh, the, in a case like this, this is actually on the physical container. The full label would be inside of this little booklet where we will see the PPE requirements and the storage requirements. And then last up, every single label will have statements on sites, AKA the crops that you can use it on or the locations that they can be used. And they will also have targets for the pests or diseases that your pesticide will treat. And this is one example um, from the BT Now label where you can see we've got the crops, which is our sites. We've got our target pests. And oftentimes um, there will be a bit of a explanation before or above the table or below the table somewhere that will talk about if you can use this in a greenhouse, in the field, in hydroponics, as a spray, as a drench, et cetera. So those are just some very bare minimum things you should know about pesticides before you use them. And specific to New York, um, I have a quick guide on how to find approved pesticides for cannabis in New York. So this is specific to you guys. This is different in every state, um, which can be, definitely be a lot to deal with. But for New York, what we're going to do is we've got this uh, URL first, which you will be provided with. So don't worry about writing it down. Once we go there, you're taken to this page, the Bureau of Pesticide Management Information Portal. What you're gonna do first is you're gonna hit the advanced search button here. This is going to allow you to search for cannabis specifically. If you don't, you can see there's a lot of registered pesticides here, right? So we're not gonna sift through all of those. We're gonna make the system do it for us. Next, once you hit that button, you're gonna see some more boxes and you're gonna to go to the use type box and you're gonna to go to use and search, type in cannabis, and this should pop up. You can click on it. Then once you've selected cannabis, you hit search. And you'll see that we've greatly reduced the number of products that you have to look through, right? So currently there's 127 products approved for cannabis in the state of New York. And if you don't wanna look at this on um, a web page, you can export this to Excel or a CSV file. If you'd like to keep a copy, I recommend that you come back periodically and check for updates, um, not weekly, but I would say like, you know, every other month or so, uh, see what's going on, see if they've added anything new to the list. And based on that, we've made, we've put together a couple of top choices for some of the pests that you'll be facing um, of pesticides that are approved in your state for um, some of the insects and mites we covered today. So for aphids and root, root aphids, we're going to be recommending um, these ones, the Pyganic specifically for root aphids, no fly, Botanicar, w, 22WP, Azagard, and Azogen. For spider mites, we really recommend Ecotech Plus and Impede. And for thrips, we've got Botanigard 22WP again, Azotin O, Moltex, and our nematodes. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on each of these, but you will be receiving a copy of this presentation where I've broken down each of those pesticides for you with all of this information, the active ingredient, your target pests, shelf life, BCA compatibility and a spray rate and in application info. So um, you will have this information. So we've got the Azteno, the Azagard, your Botanigard, Ecotech Plus, Impede, Molt X, No Fly, Hyganic, and our nematodes. But I've also given you a couple extra things. We didn't talk about diseases today. But um, the, the top two that uh, cannabis growers deal with is gonna be botrytis and powdery mildew. So I put together a couple of products that are approved in New York as well and giving you some spray rates for your records, for your reference. So we got the botrytis and here's the powdery mildew options. 
So save those for your records. And uh, thank you guys for your attention today. It looks like there's a couple of questions here. Let me open that up. Okay, I was just gonna say, okay, yeah, we do have three questions from Fred Ruckel. Um, mm -hmm. Would you like me to go ahead and read them for you or do you have it? Uh, why don't you read them for me? Okay. So how do we assure all the pests we use for protection are gone at harvest and do not simply die on the drying cannabis? All right, Fred, good question. And I have an unfortunate answer for you, which is that we don't. Um, but the same could be said about the pests that you're dealing with in, uh, in cannabis. You can't really assure that those are gonna be dead or dying or gone once you've dried the cannabis. What we can say is that when we use BCAs or when we're dealing with our um, insect pests or mite pests, they will dry up, they'll desiccate pretty um, completely and should just fall off like any other dust you might be dealing with on your cannabis. I would treat it like any other type of um, physical debris that you might be dealing with. And in most cases, you will not see any um, evidence of BCAs left on the crop at all. The next question Fred Ruckel has, um, we have Japanese beetles which look like ladybugs. Will they have the same effect? So Japanese beetles are an invasive pest that we are trying very hard to keep out of the United States. So I'm not sure that that is the organism that you're asking about. Japanese beetles will actually feed on crops um, pretty significantly. Um, there are other beetles that will prey on aphids. Um, I would not put Japanese beetles in that category. Okay, and then the last question Fred had, are all the recommendations you have made OMRI? Uh, many of them are, not all of them, but many, yes. Um, and that is a piece of information that you can find on the label. And you actually kind of see it here in the background, especially with regalia, but many other products will have um, on the label if they're OMRI list or not. If you're looking for OMRI certificates as well, those are pretty widely available at the OMRI website. You can actually search for these products and download the OMRI certificate um, freely from um, OMRI. Okay, I don't see any more questions coming in. If there, anybody has any questions, feel free to type away. Um, thank you for all attending, most appreciative. And uh, I think Erica did a wonderful job. Great presentation. All right, thank you, Tina. Thanks, Erica, that was great. For our attendees on the call, we will get a PDF of the presentation out to you. You'll see that come to you from Scott Baker. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks a lot, Erica. Another great presentation. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Okay.